Good morning, everyone. How are we today? Great. It is wonderful to see all business people here and houses of faith and nonprofits. And uh, what I want to do is I want to introduce some very special guests from the Pierce School. This Pierce School Environmental Club and a local Brookline Girl Scout troop. Yes, students, you can come right up the front. Yay. Yay. <laughs> 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 speak really loudly so that everybody can hear you. Okay. Right. We have, we're going to go for a Hi, can you everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, so I prepared a speech, but um, my name is Aspen Johnson. So I'll just tell you that. Um, the world that my friends and I will have to live in in our 20s is recognized to be uninhabitable if we do not focus on climate adaptation solutions now. Good news, there are solutions. Bad news, our government is just not doing any of them. But there's still good news. Businesses and business leaders like you can take your own action. The actions that you take include the following. Demand that your supply chain and vendors are sustainable or become sustainable. Two, join B Corp. If you do not know what B Corp is, go to about B Corp, a benefit corporation, sorry. Um, and then third, understand the value of being a sustainable local business. It provides you with marketing and public relations. In Brookline, we are sophisticated consumers. And expect a lot from companies here and will gladly support sustainable companies or take our business elsewhere if you are not sustainable. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Today I'm going to be addressing climate change and why we need to act. I have two questions. In 25 years, where will you be now? There are two possibilities. In one, you wake up each day, stretch, look out your window and see the sun shine bright. After breakfast, you go for a walk and you have a productive rest of the day. In the other option, you wake up, you don't look outside. You can hear it's raining. You turn on the TV, but it doesn't work. The power's out. You don't have breakfast because you're trying to stay healthy. You know you won't get exercise today. You haven't in months. Your house machine doesn't have power and you can't do any work. Here's another question. Where will I be in 25 years? Here's one option. I wake up and my, I wake up and my break, and I have make breakfast for my kid. Oatmeal with brown sugar. I load the car with all our ski equipment. Light powder snowflakes fall from above. I go back inside. I wake my kid up. They eat their breakfast and we go to the car. We try to catch snowflakes with our tongues. The day was great and in bed I think back all those years when I was right here in town hall and we as a species one by one started to make the change. Thank you. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Finn and I'm an eighth grader here in Pierce. Uh, and recently I spoke at my school's climate walkout. It was great to see so many of my peers taking a stand for their climate views, and today I'm here to talk to all of you and hopefully try to have some of you take action against the massive issue of global warming. Many of you know, of course, that we only have about 11 years to, at best to stop the irreversible damage that will happen to our home, and that we can expect more than a foot of sea level rise by 2050. Impossible. In addition, many believe that a sea level rise of two feet could triple the frequency of coastal flooding across the Northeast, destroying hundreds of houses and buildings. When I talked at my school, I tried to mainly emphasize the importance of our voices as the younger generation. However, today I'm speaking to the adults that can make the changes for Brookline. Many of you are town leaders, business owners, or heads of nonprofit organizations. While me and my friends may be too young to make big decisions, many of you are not. And that's why I'm speaking here today. Our planet is dying fast, and we need individuals like all of you to step up. Even small adjustments will go a long way, and with your help, we'll be able to do our part in Brookline to slow down climate change. I'm asking all of you to take the lead, make the change, and be the heroes of our world. We only have one Earth, and it's up to all of us to save it. Hi, my name is Cleo Blending. I'm from Pierce. I'm a seventh grader. Um, and I'm here to 
And I'm here because of the detrimental damage and the threat posed to climate change. Um, with fossil fuels circulating in the atmosphere, it would make much more of a difference to have sustainable businesses, and the sooner the action can occur, the sooner that we as people and the Earth can receive the benefits. But how will we go about training the local businesses to become more sustainable? Uh, cutting fossil fuels used in the workspace is a good place to start. With coal, oil, and the likes supplying 80% of the world's energy, they often leave a fair, leave a fair mark on the environment, affecting and amplifying climate change. Coal specifically is responsible for one-third of this, ultimately accounting for 44% of the world's emissions from the source. Drastic matters need to be enabled to ensure the health of the planet using an energy alternative and being energy conscious. Um, I, my name is Alice. I am from Girl Scout Troop 62558 here in Brookline. And last year we passed a Warren article, Warren article 21, everything should have a home, saying that businesses should not throw away unused merchandise and should donate it or bring it to like a shelter where someone else could use it because one of our fellow Girl Scouts and her mother works at a local business and one day, a couple of years ago, and they saw the local business workers putting unused <coughs> unopened backpacks and boots and socks and scarves and leftover <coughs> Halloween candy and things like that and school supplies and trash bags and throwing them in the dumpster and they weren't getting any use and they were just going to a landfill when we could have used those and other kids could have had school supplies and, and warmer during the winter. today we need to be able to make some changes now so that you're going to inherit a future that's bright and beautiful and has great climate and isn't we're not worrying about these things so thank you very much and have a good day wow well, how do I follow this I mean this, it's like a big pair of shoes to fill um, I want to welcome everyone and congratulate uh, you for, for taking the first step towards making some very big changes in Brookline. This day has been a long time in coming. Uh, my committee and myself, we've been planning this for a while and I never thought this day would come where we would have a room filled with people. So thank you for coming, number one. Uh, it's interesting, I'll, I'll tell you how this evolved. Nancy Heller. Uh, was at the ribbon cutting for Brookline Bank and we opened up the new branch in Coolidge Corner and she said hey I'm on the select board for climate action you're a business person you're involved with business development you're involved with the chamber would you be interested in serving on this committee 
And the one thing I've learned over time living in this town for a while is you don't say no to Nancy Heller. <laughs> so here I am. Um, and being on the Select Board for Climate Action, she gave me the charge to, to basically get businesses involved. So what I did is I set up an ad hoc committee, and we have a lot of people on that ad hoc committee, and this is the end result of it, that we're able to do something in town for small business, for nonprofits, for houses of faith, to make you aware of what you can do. Um, so basically, what I wanted to tell you is, I solicited people, I hired Ann Suddeth from uh, Suddeth Boyer Consultants, and she ended up pulling together with the help of our committee, she helped give us guidance. And uh, on my committee, I'd like to do, introduce some of the members. Allison, Allison Plant from Puppet Theater. Um, Susan Martin from Cab. Michael Kirstein, one of our business people from Simon Shoes, who will be talking today about his success story. Diane Sokol from Mothers Out Front. Colleen Suanovsky from Refrillo, and she provided our food today. And we actually have a best practice of a green restaurant. Please make sure you patronize this green restaurant. It's not so easy to get this green certification. I'm a part of the food. Yeah, yeah thank you, Tommy. Uh, Ann Sadeth, who I mentioned already. Rabbi Mermelstein from Torah Academy. David Lescopier from the Select Board for Climate Action and an active town meeting member and a Zen of solar power. Thank you for coming. Uh, as we know, it takes money to pay for a consultant and to be able to run this type of course, this type of workshop. The food, the printing materials, the giveaways, compliments of Eversource, thank you very much Eversource, and a raffle drawing and so much more. Many thanks to our financial sponsors who Without their financial support, this wouldn't happen. I want to mention Hamilton Company Charitable Foundation. I want to mention Eversource. I want to mention CAB for their financial support, Brookline Bank, and Chestnut Hill Realty. And the town for providing this room today and the space. And uh, Zoe, who has given us some guidance with regards to where we're heading with this. I would also like to thank our stakeholders. Basically, CAB, Mothers Out Front, Boyer Son of Consultants, and the Brookline Chamber of Commerce. Thank you, Debbie, for taking the lead and helping uh, us be able to make this day come true and having the Chamber help to drive this through our website and our organizations. Lastly, I want to introduce a few special people just to acknowledge, and I'm going to give it to Ann. Um, Ann Sutter from Boyer Son of Consulting, Zoe Lynn, our Sustainability Coordinator from Town. Maureen Kiley from Eversource Energy Efficiency, our own representative Tommy Vitillo, uh, our success story panel, uh, Michael Kirstein, owner of Simon Shoes, Colleen Suanowski, owner of Refrillo, Bobby Zucca from the Village Works and the Team Center, Diane Sokol from Mothers Out Front, Sue Martin, Climate Action Brookline, Chrissy Christy Electris, Climate Action Brookline, and Mothers Out Front, Diane Mark, Mothers Out Front, Jan Prenheim, Mothers Out Front, Alan Leviton, Climate Action Brookline, and I especially want to say about Climate Action Brookline, they were my actual financial place that they were actually taking the money and they're going to be cutting the checks for me uh, because we didn't have a nonprofit number, so I appreciate CAB stepping up to the plate and helping us out that way. And um, Dean Cody from Mothers Out Front. Did I miss anyone? Okay, I did miss Raul Fernandez, who is our newest select person in town. I want to thank him for coming, and uh, Nancy Hell is here. Raul in particular, he works at BU, however, his part-time job is being a select person, and he is chairing the uh, action committee for a small business. And I think it's especially great that he's here. He's starting to give direction on what small businesses can do, and I'm hoping that Climate Action is going to be part of that charge. Absolutely. So thank you. Without further ado, I want to turn it over to our Oz, the woman behind the curtain, the woman who has helped organize this event, Ann Sutter. Thank you, David. So I'm going to click us over. Everybody has a copy of the agenda on their chair, um, but a quick highlight, uh, we're going to have 
uh, presentations from three fabulous guest speakers. And then we're going to switch gears and we'll hear from our success story panelists. And then we're going to break into six small groups and you all will get to talk to each other. Uh, and I want to make sure we keep moving so that we have time for a real dialogue amongst the group. I'll encourage you also to stay until the end because I know we have some great raffle prizes and you only are eligible if you complete your evaluation at the very end. So <laughs> stay until the bitter end and you'll get a prize. And um, well worth it. It's well worth it, yes. So um, I think it'd be great for us to be able to zip around the room and hear who's here with us. Uh, but to do that in the time frame we have, we're going to have to all say Scouts Honor that we will not give a speech. We will only say our name and our organization. Some of you are representing multiple organizations. You can list them, but no speeches. Can we do that? Okay. I'm Ann Suddeth, Boyer Suddeth Environmental Consultants, and I'm also part of Mothers Out Front. I'm Roxy Myram. I'm the Artistic Director of Showplace Theater. Tabitha McCartney, Asset Management and Sustainability Director at Two Life Communities. We're building right on Harvard Street. Joel Tool with Two Life Communities as well. Alan Levitin, Climate Action Brookline. I'm James Carr. I'm an architect. I'm on the planning board and also the Select Board Climate Action Commission Committee. I'm Marie Conneau, Tufts University, and I co lead the <coughs> Climate Action um, at Temple Bed Zion. David Lowe, I'm town meeting member, Climate Action Brookline, so, um, Resonant Solar. Raul Fernandez, Brookline Select Board. Paul Harris, town meeting member, Precinct 9. <coughs> Alfred Ronell, West Forest, Brookline. Jan Preheim, Mothers Out Front. Teresa Fortillas, Brookline Community Foundation. Uh, Lex Vasquez, uh, Brookline Arts Center. Lauren Riviello, Brookline Arts Center. Muriel Vautrain, Studio MLA Architect. Sarah Jane Huber, also with Studio MLA Architects. Abby Zucker with the Village Works and the Brookline Teen Center. Chopi Hoy, um, Brookline Teen Center, uh, and uh, other. <laughs> <laughs> also the Chamber. <laughs> and the Chamber, yes. Uh, Susan Martin, Climate Action Brookline. Uh, David Lescoyer, Town Meeting Member, Climate Action Brookline. Uh, and the advisor, climate, Select Board's Climate Action Committee. Diane Sokol, Mothers Out Front. Nancy Heller, Select Board and Co-Chair of uh, Climate Action uh, Committee, Select Board's Climate Action Committee. Michael Kirstein, Simon Shoes. Bethany Brown, Brothers and Sisters Co. Linda Katz, Temple Sinai, and Bruce Pointer. Andrew Haber, <coughs> Sunshine Academy. Daniel DeLoma, Managing Director of Puppet Show Place Theater. Hugh Madison, Brooklyn Green Space Alliance. Michaela Bell, Nella. Meredith Mooney, Economic Development in Town Hall. Tina McCarthy, Historic Preservation in Town Hall. Maury Saposnik, Olive Connection. Judy Harity, Brookline, Sister City. Madeline Fine, Fine Creations Jewelry and First Parish, Brookline. Aidy D. Larissa, the percent of St. Mary's Church in School. Ronald uh, Monty from uh, St. Mary. Uh, Jessica Yulian from the Coolidge Corner Guest House, Bed and Breakfast, and Temple of Abishalom. Debbie Miller, Brookline Chamber of Commerce. Fred Perry, Boston Electronics Corporation. John Harris, Climate Action Brookline. Tom Kilday, Climate Action Brookline. Daria Mark, Mother's Out Front. Uh, Margaret Ito, Mother's Out Front. Zoe Lynn, the Town Sustainability Program Administrator. Kathleen Scanlon, uh, Town Meeting Member, Select Board Climate Action Committee, uh, Mother's Out Front, and I work with Studio MLA Architects. <laughs> Food is delicious, by the way. Thank you. Lynn Karsten, Brookline Department of Public Health. Tommy Vitolo, Massachusetts House of Representatives. Patrick Owens, Eversource. George Conway, Lime Energy. Maureen Kylie, Eversource. Christy Electris, Climate Action Brookline, and Tommy Vinata. Phyllis Tierman, Sustainable Wells. Clara, you want to introduce yourself also? Clara Kaufman, Brookline Chamber of Commerce. And Corbin. Uh, Corbin Rydell, Brookline Director Group. Thank you, Big. And Dave Gladstone, Brookline Bank <coughs> Chamber, and the Select Board for Climate Action. Back to you, Anne. Great. Did we miss anybody? Well done. This is a great um, mix of government and nonprofits and business owners. So thank you all for coming and for being part of this pilot. Um, I think, um, switch us over. I think I want to emphasize this word pilot. Uh, because all of us are actually creating something together. 
we are testing out an idea, uh, proving its value. So today, we not only want you to see yourself in the role of participant, but also as contributor to really shape um, the nature of this program and see how we can make it be as effective as possible in uh, the town. The pilot has four parts. You see them up here today. The workshop is our kickoff. That's the first part. The next is the self-assessment. Um, this morning, everybody should, who's registered ahead of time should have received an email um, from me with a link to an online self-assessment. And we're going to spend some time later in the agenda actually getting into that, actually clicking on the link and starting it together. And that is an opportunity for you both to um, document what you've already done and sort of find your points of pride for your organization, but also to learn what you could do next. What else could you do to make your business or organization more climate friendly and more sustainable? Um, the other piece is peer learning. Um, today, when we're in our small group conversation, when we're learning from our success story panel, we're trying to create a conversation amongst the members of this community about how organizations and businesses uh, can contribute. Uh, and the last piece is recognition. We really want to um, recognize the work that you all are already doing and that you will do. As our young students explained this morning, um, you know, 80 percent of the, or actually 90 percent globally, um, of the uh, population surveyed expects businesses to do more than just make a profit. Uh, and we know that that drive to um, spend their purchasing dollars for sustainable goods and services is actually even more prevalent among the millennials and the Generation Z. So that is a rising trend. So it's important not only for you to do the right thing, but also to celebrate it and have it be publicly known so that people actually can choose your business or organization knowing that, they that you have shared values with them. Um, so a couple quick things. This program has built into it several really powerful motivators. Uh, we all know that something that can be done someday often happens never. Um, so we have a deadline for you to take action. Um, when you're part of a group like this, it's helpful to know that what feels like a small action actually multiplies when you're part of a group, uh, so your impact is greater. Um, and then the third part is um, that we're adding in that recognition piece. So to know that you're going to be celebrated for doing the right thing and that it actually can uh, be good for your bottom line for your business um, is the, the last piece. So. Uh, during the small group time, we'll have a chance to get your feedback about what type of recognition would actually be most meaningful your, for your organization. But at this point, we're thinking about a door decal, we're thinking about um, listing on the Chamber website, profile stories like the ones that are already loaded up there now, uh, and a celebration event that would be led um, through the chamber in 2020. But we're really interested in your ideas and feedback. So make sure in your small group that you write down your ideas on the piece of paper you'll get or you share them with your facilitator in your small group. How many folks have visited the gogreen.brooklinechamber.com website so far? So a few. So I encourage you to go um, and visit that because uh, Susan Martin and Diane Sokol and others in the committee have done an amazing job of populating this site not only with stories about Temple Beth Zion and one of the chiropractors in town and uh, there's going to be a new article on Two Life Communities. There's a number of articles about success stories that are not uh, here with us on the panel today, but there's also a lot of resources for you to access. Um, the students this morning um, referenced, in essence, the triple bottom line. Who's heard of this concept, right? So it's more than just financial performance. You're looking at people, plan, and nonprofit. How does your business impact your employees and the community more broadly and also the environment? Uh, and how you spend your dollars and how you purchase uh, and what you purchase is actually a huge part of how you can actually drive change as a business owner or organization. I'm not going to belabor that point because I feel like the kids actually did a really great job of, of raising that. Um, but one of the questions we're hoping to answer this morning, um, and we saw your responses to the questions outside, was what can you do as a business, a nonprofit or a faith organization? Um, and through the survey, you're going to hopefully answer that question for yourself and also through the conversation with others. Uh, if you don't get your questions answered today, then we want to hear from you about that too, because that may be workshop number two is what we focus on. Um, but today we're really focused specifically on energy. Uh, why energy? This is one of the key ways we can reduce our climate impact as nonprofits, businesses, and faith organizations. Uh, and when we say energy, we're talking about electricity uh, as well as the energy you use to heat or cool your facility. Um, 
we're going to hear more from, from Tommy Vitolo and from Maureen at Eversource about different energy solutions. But what we're really trying to focus on is sourcing your energy from renewables and investing in efficiency. So if you take away two things, sourcing from renewables and investing in energy efficiency. Okay, I'm gonna switch it over to Zoe. Zoe is the, Zoe Lynn is the town sustainability program administrator and she is a force to be reckoned with. She's only been here for six months. She is leading and coordinating all the climate and sustainability initiatives for the town of Brookline. Uh, she recently launched working teams across the town um, and she's through those harnessing all the expertise and the commitment and energy of community members from every part of Brookline. And I think um, probably many of the people in this room have already worked with Zoe or supporting her. So whatever we can do to help um, help your work. We're really and, grateful and to have really you here. Zoe has been in two places at once, so I'm pretty amazed <laughs> yeah. at what, what you do and we've yes. been. She's sort of like Hermione Granger, right? You have like a little bag of tricks. You, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. That's yes. a very nice awesome. introduction. Um, yeah. I have worked with many of you, and I'm glad to see many of you here today. And there's a lot of new faces here, so thank you very much for being here. Um, I think uh, um, I would like to start with highlighting what Anne was uh, pointing out. Brookline is extraordinary. It's got expertise, commitment, uh, passion for dealing with sustainability issues, and I've never seen anything like it. People usually hire me to engage people in these issues, but here people are really engaged, they're very concerned about these issues, and they're uh, trying to figure out how to take action. So that's an amazing, amazing um, starting point uh, for climate mitigation and adaptation programs. So I was hired by the town of Brookline to administer the select boards uh, sustainability programs, which is uh, integrated environmental planning. And uh, one particular goal that's uh, um, uh, very important to the select board and the community of Brookline is their zero emissions goal by 2050. So to achieve zero climate impacting emissions town-wide and community-wide by 2050. Uh, that's uh, a great goal to have. There's a couple things about it. Uh, uh, the science says we absolutely need to be there um, if we want a livable planet. Um, the science says we actually need to move quicker, and then the science and uh, change management says that that is a very tough and aggressive target. So we've got on one side science saying that's a really important target, you need to be moving quicker on your zero emissions goals. On the other side, change management says, wow, we have to roll over all of our infrastructure and all of our building uh, energy demand um, in the next 30 years to reach this goal. So we have a lot of work to do, it's very important, and uh, the commercial sector uh, plays a really important role in helping us achieve that. Um, Massachusetts does a greenhouse gas trend inventory. Um, this one might be from the town of Brookline, yeah. um, 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 greenhouse gas inventory in 2008, but the commercial sector, depending on how you uh, count the emissions, uh, if you're uh, including uh, all impacts, uh, indirect and direct emissions can be significant. Um, and, uh, um, and to achieve our town-wide zero emissions goal by 2050, we not only have to be talking about uh, the commercial sector, we have to be very much integrating it into our planning. Um, because we're all uh, part of a community that works together in our network. And so this is a really important uh, event today that you're here at. So um, uh, the select board um, to help with this integrated planning has um, adopted a, a biennial so, uh, sustainable and climate action summit process. So uh, twice a year, approximately twice a year, uh, with the first one being in June of, uh, of this past this past June, June 5th, uh, the select board calls on all community members to come and be involved in a very collaborative, uh, brainstorming, uh, solution-based process. Uh, and then after that, we get to work on what we heard at the at the summit to deliver on these initiatives. So right now we have about 10 working teams that um, I facilitate and bring processes and recommendations back to the select boards or our other many elected bodies or appointed bodies in town government. Um, and then, after th so those working teams then uh, bring, like I just, wow, those are all say number one. <laughs> They're all high priorities. <laughs> they were numbered one, okay. Um, and then they go through, so for example, um, at the summit we heard a lot about um, transportation and how important it is 
that we started doing integrated transportation. So the working team came together and they put a Warren article out, Warren Article 31, and that will go in front of the select board tonight and in front of many other boards and commissions as we go through to town meeting. That's one example of the many working teams. The select board will hear that, uh, then open up public hearings. We will go through a very significant public process and then town meeting will vote. Um, and we are taking many initiatives through that process. And then we start over. And that's how we're moving forward at this point. And the commercial sector that was giving us feedback at the summit and is giving me feedback through this process is helping to shape our next actions to achieve this goal and uh, many other important uh, goals across the town. So here's a list of some of the working teams. If you want to be involved, we uh, would love to have you. Right now, we're focused a lot on what's called the warrant, the town meeting produces a warrant uh, twice a year to, and that's your uh, legislative process. Um, and I mentioned one of them, but most of these are going through uh, some type of legislative process right now. The renewable energy team, for example, there's two warrants. One is a zoning bylaw change that would allow ground-mounted solar. Um, uh, another one is a select board power purchase um, authorization through town meeting. I'm not going to get into the details of that one. I mentioned one of, the, one of the six sustainable transportation legislative pieces that are in front of uh, the town government this uh, fall. Um, uh, if you're interested in uh, zero waste, composting, and sustainable food, we're going to have SWAC, uh, the S select board's um, uh, solid, waste. solid Waste Advisory Committee will be meeting October 1 in the Denny Room to start with uh, some dialogue about that uh, initiative for the schools. Um, so there's a lot of places you can get, be involved. This isn't meant to be a comprehensive uh, list. If you are interested in working with the uh, public process and helping us uh, network and uh, support you, then uh, you can reach out to me or you can reach out to Meredith. Meredith, will you please uh, raise She's our economic uh, development <coughs> planner, my colleague, and we'll be happy to work with you, and we look forward to working with you. And that's it. Yeah, we stay up for some questions. Does anybody yeah. have any questions for Zoe? And thank you so much. Yeah, sure. sure. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Anyone have any questions for Zoe? It's okay. That was a lot to take in. You can think about it and let us know. Yeah. And, uh, and I'll see. I'll, I see many of you a lot, so I'll see you soon. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you, Zoe. <laughs> thank you. Tommy, you are up. Yeah. <laughs> so Tommy Vitolo is, as he mentioned, our state representative, representing multiple parts of Brookline, but not all of Brookline, Correct. although you're in all of our hearts, even if you're not representing <laughs> us. Uh, and I know you have something in common with Maureen. I think you have a BU connection, is that yeah. right? So we have Raul, and we have a, quite a BU contingent here this yeah. morning, which is great. So in addition to serving as our state representative, Tommy is an expert in energy issues and a consultant in this area. So we are very lucky to have him here um, to help us understand how we can make change through renewables. So appreciate you being here this morning, Tommy. Sure. Thank well, thank you. Uh, what I love about this crowd is I know half of you and like that half, and the other half I just haven't gotten to know yet. So this is really a great crowd for me. And I do want to take a minute and thank the small business owners who are here. I serve on the Joint Committee for Small Business, and I know an 80-hour work week is a light week if you run a small business, and so to take the time to come here it really is significant. I think that uh, I, at least, have tremendous respect for the small business owners and managers who are able to make some time to come here. I know it's a, it is actually a real sacrifice, so thank you. Um, this is not just a pocket square. These are my notes, so I will, I will pull from them. Uh, so I got, I got a couple of things. We're going to number them one, 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 and one. Um, the first one is how green electricity works. And in fact, it works a lot. Uh, it, works, it works in a way that's very similar to how a bank works. So at the end of the day, you take your cash and you do a drop at the bank, right? Hopefully you had a great day, a lot of cash, drop it at the bank. When you make a withdrawal three weeks later, they don't give you the same $20 bills that you put in three weeks ago, right? They don't do that. They give you a different set of $20 bills. But because we have dual entry accounting, we make sure that all of the dollars are accounted for. And green electricity works the same way. So when there's a wind turbine or a solar panel generating electricity, that electricity is put into the grid. It's put into the bank. And an accountant is keeping very careful track of how many megawatt hours of green electricity are produced. And every single one of those is accounted for. So when you sign up for 
receiving green electricity in your business or in your home, you are saying, I got dibs on some of that green energy. And if it goes to you, it cannot also go to anybody else. In the same way, if you withdraw money from the bank, it doesn't also go to somebody else. And so green electricity is a way that you can dramatically reduce your carbon emissions. Electricity is about a third of our emissions as a society. Um, for businesses, we're talking about lighting, we're talking about cooling, uh, there may be other, other uses as well. And the reason why it may be a really nice place to start for small businesses, in addition to energy efficiency, which we'll hear about later, is number one, it's not disruptive to the day-to-day -day business, right? You make a phone call, but it doesn't change your retail environment at all. It doesn't impact in any way your interaction with customers, with vendors, with anyone else. So that's a real advantage if you're a business. Also, number one, um, it doesn't require capital, right? You're not writing a check to get something done. This is just on your monthly bill, right? And so while it is, it is a slight additional operating expense, you don't need capital to do this. You can make the decision and move forward. And for businesses, many businesses, that's critical. Also number one, because everything is number one today, um, it builds on a multi-community spiral of good. And so uh, several communities rolled out green electricity as part of community choice aggregation and buzz got around. So then Brookline heard about it and we said, we're gonna increase the default from 5% to 25% and roll it out with the hope that Newton gets jealous. And sure enough, they did, <laughs> right? And now they're doing like 43% or something, right? And so the idea is that everyone who takes a step forward encourages everyone else to come with them. And so the step that we're asking is not just to take that default 25%, but to opt up to 100%. Can't do any more than that. That's all, right? And the more businesses, the more residents who opt up to 100%, the more we can stick it to Newton, who's also trying to do the same thing, right? And we want to best them. We want to have a higher number. And what's great is you're not just moving Brookline forward, you're also moving Newton forward. And you know, there are other communities who are saying, you know, Amherst is like, wait a minute, what about us? We're the best, right? And so this spiral of good, rather than a, a sort of a negative spiral or a downward spiral, this spiral of good really does bring about change in addition to the change that you're doing in your own business or home, right? You're multiplying and that's so important. So that's why it matters, and, and there'll be lots of information about how to do it. I'm not gonna get into the details. It's all sorted out. Nancy Heller on the select board has been amazing on this issue, really a leader, and so thank you, Nancy, for being so great on this. Um, I wanna talk briefly about what's happening about energy and climate in the State House, because that's kind of where I spend a lot of time. Um, there's a lot of things that are bubbling around. It's not clear what's gonna bubble to the top in this session. Uh, we already passed what was called Greenworks, and that's a great program that will help fund climate resiliency and mitigation efforts for cities and towns, for local governments, which is great, but not so critical for this crowd who cares about small businesses, right? Um, other things that are kicking around include the prospect of a price on carbon, where uh, some of the revenue will be refunded back, other will be used to invest in more zero carbon efforts. Uh, so that's kicking around. There's also what's called the 2050 Roadmap Bill, which will say, okay, if we're gonna get to 80% or more reductions by 2050, how are we actually gonna get there on a year-by-year -year basis and not just say, yeah, 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 2050. Uh, so those are some key bills that are kicking around. There are plenty of other ones. I have a bill uh, related to uh, natural gas heating specifically. Uh, my observation is since we can't use natural gas to heat our buildings in 2040 and 2050 and meet our climate targets, the best thing we can do is stop building new natural gas heating, right? Stop digging. And the institutions that take the longest view are government, universities, and hospitals. They, they expect to be in the same buildings 30 years from now. Uh, we hope all of our small businesses are too, but we recognize there's more churn there, right? So my bill says, hey, state government, stop building natural gas heating systems in your own buildings because it's bad spend if we're gonna have to rip it out later, right? And so 
we've talked a lot about electricity, we've talked about transportation, and we're making progress, but heating is the last nut to crack of the three, and because heating systems last a long time, we need to get started sooner in addressing it so that we don't have to spend money ripping out something that we paid to install 15 or 20 years ago. That's bad spend. We don't want to do that. Uh, finally, uh, I want to point, this is my last number one. Um, we're going to do this, right? I mean, look at the folks who are here today. Again, everybody has other things they could be doing. Things for their business, uh, things at their job, but we're here because we're going to do this. And we're going to do it together, and it's going to take work. It's going to take real effort. We're going to make decisions without all the information, right? We do that all the time. We're going to have to do that here. We don't know if everything we're going to try is going to work the first time. That's all right. Small business folks do that all the time, right? You're all constantly making your best guess on what's going to work. And sometimes it works. And if it doesn't, figure it out and quickly change, right? And that's what we're going to do. And my hope is that uh, everyone at the chamber and uh, the, the local business districts talk to each other and bring each other on board. My hope is that the folks in, who work in this building continue to provide support and provide more support where needed to help it happen. You all need to say, hey, this is the thing we need, right? Folks in this building need to be listening to that, including town meeting. And, you know, it's, I'm, the, I'm the connection from Brookline to the State House, so call me. Talk to me about small business issues. Talk to me about energy issues. How can the state be a partner? We've got to get it done. We need to do it together. We're going to do it. The, that you're here today shows you're going to be part of it. And I'm thrilled for that. So thank you, everyone, for being here. And what's next? Hey, well, we may have a question. Question. And I want to say, if anybody wanted to ask a question about on-site solar, I know sure. we have a number of faith organizations here who own their own buildings and maybe thinking about. So if there's a question about that, Tommy could be somebody to ask. Sure. Or any other question. Or I question. can push it off to David Lesquay or someone else. Yes. <laughs> any questions for Tommy? This is up. You've satisfied okay. So, so yeah. just a question about um, green electricity. So when all of the businesses say, okay, 100%, does that actually change the amount of That's renewable a, energy that great question. is what happens, grid? right? And the answer is, yes, it does. And here's why. In this part of the country, in New England, all of the utilities are obligated to buy a certain amount of renewable electricity. And that quantity goes up every year, right? And so we have a certain number of wind turbines and solar panels and small hydro and, and uh, municipal uh, trash burning, which is not the best, but it does count as renewable. Um, and they're producing this green electricity every day, right? And they've got to make enough to fulfill all of the utility obligations plus anything extra that people choose to procure, right? And if they're not making enough, then the market price for that green electricity goes up. And the utilities have to pay more, and all of the voluntary folks have to pay more. But look, this is Econ 101, right? I'm talking to a bunch of small business owners about economics. It feels a little weird, right? When the price goes up, what happens? More developers come into the market to build more renewables because that price is good enough for them to make a profit. And so there's a marketplace for green electricity at present for those who care about this stuff. A one megawatt hour of green electricity is worth about $22 plus the value of the electricity itself. That price fluctuates. It's been as high in New England as 50 bucks. It actually can't get much higher than that because we put a price ceiling on it. Um, in some parts of the country, it's as low as seven bucks where renewable electricity is easier to generate and where demand is lower because states aren't being as forward thinking about this. But to answer your question, every time somebody buys some voluntarily and makes it so that the utilities can't get it, more has to be built for the utilities to satisfy their obligations. Right? It's just a limited resource and every time we take some out, some more has to backfill. And that's why it's so effective. Great question. I have a question more for Anne, but is there a decal for a business that buys the 100% clean electricity? We basically, that's the one thing I was going to comment on afterwards. Uh, Nancy Heller is leading the effort through the Select Board for Climate Action with other stakeholders about 100% opting up. If any business signs up uh, to go 100%, 
Nancy just told me that we're more than happy to give them a sign to put it in their window of their business. So we will have, we're going to do this after the fact, we're going to have a sign up sheet if anyone's interested uh, to be able to get that sign if they opt up to 100% for their business. And I will add, I do a, I do a newsletter to about 2,500 folks and I'm always looking to celebrate local success stories. So small businesses that opt up to 100% if they want, I'd be happy to feature them in my newsletter as well. Get the word out as many ways as we can. And, Celebrate and, and success. Talking to what Tommy's saying, I'm certain we can do something on our green website with the chamber to be able to highlight businesses that have opted up yeah. and give you some exposure uh, in Brookline on our chamber website. We've got to celebrate our, our wins. Green. So we, um, Two Life Communities has a virtual net metering contract where mm -hmm. we get um, a million kilowatts of electricity um, from a solar yep. farm that was built in Woburn. Can we count, can we be 100% green if we're buying and we put it all on our building in Brookline? So my question to you is, it's a bit of a technical question, is does that, does that quantity of kilowatt hours provide for 100% of your electricity or do you also have a little bit left you've got to buy? It, it can provide for 100% of our electricity over the course of in, our, in our Brookline building. You expect over the course of the year it'll yep. get you to 100%? Yep. So then, quite simply, you could opt up to 100% and, you know, essentially buy zero more, but you're still there. Yeah, I, I think that, I think that, that yeah. we can't opt up to 100% with the utility because, right. because yeah, we're oh, because you've got a third party. Yeah, 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 yeah third understood. party that's much less expensive yeah. than the utility. Yeah, so that's an interesting question is if you do it in a way that's not through this particular program, what happens? Yeah. And I don't have an answer for that question, but it's a yeah, question that so we can talk about. talk about it later, but I think also you would still get in, in terms of this program, that yeah. climate is everybody's business, that would give you points within this self-assessment. Um, so you would be recognized through the climate is everybody's business. Yeah. Even and if also not later on, you're gonna be talking about, you're one of the featured, your group is one of the featured speakers. They have a green roof. They're doing like hot water solar from on their roof. So you guys are doing a lot of fantastic things and you're an example of doing it up front because you're just breaking ground now and doing a development. So thank you for what you're doing. Yeah. I just want to point out one thing, that the poster here is for the Town of Brookline's Community Choice Aggregation Electricity Program. You're probably getting lots of phone calls, lots of letters in the mail from other programs. The Brookline program has been vetted by the Attorney General and the state. We don't know about some of the others. In fact, the Attorney General has talked about some of the programs being uh, you know, I can't remember what the word they used, but questionable. Yeah, scams, but they had a better word. Predatory, predatory companies. So we think that the safest one is to go with the Brookline Green Electricity because the rates are stable. It's all been a vetted program through the town. And there are lots of other mailings and phone calls you'll be getting. Yeah, and actually we are getting calls internally that people are some people are have been caught in these bad contracts. Um, so the town does have an informal position on this. I mean, if you want to stay with that resource, that's fine, but, or stay with the vetted program with the town. But unless you have somebody that, um, a good lawyer, or somebody that's looking at some of these other programs, that we are not recommending you go with them because some of them have been fraudulent, some of them are scams, and unless you know how to sort through that, it is very, very complicated market out there. So the Brookline Green Electricity Program comes, usually it's um, with Eversource, Brookline's logo, and, or, and then currently our supplier is Dynagy, that will change in January, but uh, so the community choice that that program, or um, you can get some um, staying with Eversource if you're, if you're not interested in the program, but the key is some of these other programs, make sure you're vetting them, or um, uh, be, be at least be aware that some of them are scams. There's okay. people that are getting calls that say, town of Brookline, and we're not running any call program, so it's yeah, not. And there's some envelopes that come out with the states, the, sta the like a, diagram of Massachusetts and they're not connected to Massachusetts nor any other affiliate and it's kind of deceptive. Yeah. So I think we have time for one other quick question and then I want to switch us over to Maureen. Well, my question is, uh, do you feel that the utilities, the big utilities are doing enough and, uh, and uh, if, if not, what is the state doing to encourage them to do more? So um, I've spent the last eight years intervening in public utility dockets around the country. So I have a pretty good feel for how this works at a regulatory level. And the short answer is, the utilities are doing exactly as much as we tell them to do. And in fact, in many cases, they're not allowed to do more than that, right? They're not allowed to make choices to go above and beyond what we ask them to do. 
Now, could they do a better job with all of their programs? Could they find ways to get more energy efficiency out there to market a little better? Could they find ways to save a little money on each distribution circuit upgrade? I'm sure that they could always do a better job. We could all do a better job at our job, right? But the, the right question is the second part, which is, well, what is the state doing to ask more of them? Because that's what I think we need to be doing. I think that we, state government, needs to say, hey, you're a franchise. We could take, Eversource could disappear off the map tomorrow. They only get to operate because the state allows them to. That's how it works. They're a regulated monopoly. And so we, state government, set their standards. And they have said consistently, you tell us what the standard is, hopefully you tell us with enough time so we can prepare for it, and we're going to get it done. And I believe that. And so state government needs to ratchet up the renewable portfolio standard. That obligation, that renewable obligation that Roxy asked about, if we require them to buy more renewable electricity, they're going to do it. And then we're going to have more, right? The state can do more about including things like uh, the social cost of carbon in the energy efficiency cost evaluation so that more energy efficiency is cost effective, so that Eversource and other utilities partner with businesses and homes to deploy more of it, right? So um, I think it's, it's easy to throw rocks at the power company, and I, I, I'm just as guilty of it as everyone else. Um, and sometimes they deserve it. I'm not, you know, sometimes they do. But I think that um, for the most part, if we want more from them, we need state government to be clear about what we want from them and to put it into law. And that's how we're going to get there. Well, just a quick follow-up, though. It's, it's hard to get them, for instance, to res be responsive on things like rebates for small business improvements, which are very, very small from their point of view. They don't you know, rise to the level of getting their attention. So you know, I've been very frustrated trying mm -hmm. to get small rebates from them for things that I've done. So I don't have uh, a lot of experience working with utilities personally on energy efficiency programs. And again, I have no doubt there's room for improvement. And where there's room for improvement, we need to demand that. And in fact, uh, the Attorney General, Maura Healy, is a great resource for that. She is the people's lawyer in this case. Well, you say that, but I have bad experience of trying to get them to do that I'm sorry either because that. they said it wasn't really their job to push the utility. Let's talk so offline and see if we can come up with, with a solution. Also is, I hear our state rep is pretty good about this. So how do we go <laughs> ahead so and bad. pressure? I hear. So how do we go ahead and pressure the rest of government to do mm -hmm. more? Because mm -hmm. they're always, you know, compromising down. Yeah. Um, well, you know the. The state is, is diverse and the voters are diverse in the state. And so, you know, what you're really asking is how do we get other representatives to feel this pressure as well? How do we get other senators to feel this pressure as well in other parts of the state? And the answer is, realistically, it's got to come from their voters, right? If you call the state rep from Marlboro, uh, he or she might be polite, but that goes right in the round file, right? That goes right in the trash can because you're not a voter for that representative or that senator. Um, and so the answer is we lead by example locally and we talk about it an awful lot to our friends from across the state and say, hey, we need you on board too. Can we and then it, the governor? Absolutely. Okay. Um, and, and then it's also my job to keep working on it as well. I know we could keep talking That's with Tommy nice all day because um, you have so much that you can share, so much wisdom. Um, but I think you're going to stay for a little bit. I will. Yeah. I will. So um, if people have burning questions, you could ask Tommy you at a sidebar. But thank you for you're joining us. Thank you. Um, Maureen, you're up on deck, and we'll switch over to your slides. But I wanted to just, while Maureen's coming up, I wanted to say I, I hope it's clear that um, with the program, we're really we're trying to not only engage all of you to recognize your efforts and to support you. Um, but as Zoe made it clear, this commercial sector actually is about 25% of the emissions for the town of Brookline. So we're actually trying to do our part to reduce the impact of this sector, and then also really to support the town of Brookline in achieving its goals. So there's sort of three pieces of what you know the big picture aims are. Uh, and Maureen is here, Maureen Kiley from Eversource. Thank you so much for being here. She is um, representing one of our sponsors this morning and also an expert. Um, she is here to tell us about energy efficiency. And give me one second. Sorry. 
So while she's getting that set up, um, just to give you a little yeah. background, um, I too am a small business owner in my town. I am also a city councilor in my town, so I understand the pains from all walks of life. I would just say to you, um, I didn't print this out, but um, on the Eversource, um, we, we are very proud of our number one status in energy efficiency, and that is something that they focus on and push us for every day um, as we work. But I would just say to you, um, on our energy, um, excuse me, Eversource website, if you go to the main page on about, you'll see our um, sustainability strategy, and it's definitely outlined there and, and everything that we're doing. So um, certainly making great strides on behalf of uh, folks. So first thing I'm going to say is I'm going to invite all of you to start saving today. So I brought a light bulb for each of you. Mm -hmm. And if everybody in this room goes home and just changes out one 60-watt light bulb to this light bulb, we will have about 159,000 kWh uh, savings. Just, just all of you taking that one light bulb home, and that's free of charge, of course. And those can be found with um, my call, one of my colleagues down the back here. Just want to introduce Patrick Owens, who's in the green shirt down the back. Patrick works with me on a daily basis, managing uh, the 80,000 customers that we have in the small business sector uh, throughout the state. And then to his right is George Conway. And George is a program manager with Lime Energy Group. And Lime is the vetted vendor uh, partner with, that works with us, with our small business folks um, here in Brookline. Um, I would tell you that our um, small business also includes our nonprofits and it also includes our houses of worship. We treat all of them the same because we understand certainly the costs that are associated with improvements and we want to do our best to help out. I know you had some questions about um, rebates and so on and so forth, so hopefully I'll be able to outline some of this. So obviously what do we, we uh, offer a small business? You know, we, our big thing is lowering operating costs. Um, we have access to 0% financing directly through the utility. It's not an on, I want to be very clear, it is not an on-bill finance. It's a sundry bill that we provide in addition to your regular bill. But that is for the small portion that we ask that the small business owners would pay. Uh, we obviously would like you to lower your energy bills, um, improve in your environment for your business. I, I often talk to business owners who say to me, I, when I walk in, I say, Tell me about your business. Tell me what your problems are. And they'll say to me, oh, it's so dark over here. Or I'll say, does anybody buy anything in this? I see these shelves are a bit dusty. Do you have, what's the reason? And, well, it's so dark over there. Well, that's something we can simply fix, right? Um, I remember when I first started in the utility, I went down to um, Sylvania, and they showed us three business storefronts. And they had three uh, mannequins dressed in the same red dress. I remember because I spotted the red dress right away and thought, oh, I'd love that dress. But then as they turned on the lighting in each of the three windows, I realized that th I didn't like the dress in the other two windows. So clearly it definitely has an impact on not only the environment, but on, on your business, right? Um, so I, um, obviously this the big part about this program is it's a turnkey approach. We come in um, you have an opportunity to sign up for, you can do this today if you'd like, a small business energy uh, audit. Uh, George and his team would come out and do that. Take a look at any potential energy audits, uh, uh, energy savings. We would then provide you a proposal. That proposal includes up to 70% incentive. Um, we basically pay for your savings you know, through, through the incentive, uh, through the pool of money that we collect um, as part of your bill. You're, you're all contributing that to that, so why leave money on the table? Um, well, I, if you can just switch to the next slide, maybe for a second. So, so these are some of the things, obviously, that we look at. We look at lighting controls, gas equipment and controls, HVAC equipment, motors, refrigeration controls, VFDs and pumps, insulation and envelope. And one of the big things that we're doing right now is these mini splits. We're real excited about this, getting rid of some of these uh, folks that have oil and propane and moving them to mini splits, and we're, we're highly incentivizing those. Um, the comfort in this room right now, and it's so quiet. And you know, to, uh, as soon as I walked in, Patrick points it up to the mini splits because he's he's heavily involved with that part of our program, and and they're just wonderful. They're wonderful. And I, I I just talked to somebody the other day, a small commercial developer, who said he's moved away from traditional uh, resources. He's going with mini splits. So so that's that's pretty awesome for us. Um, so who is eligible? Obviously, our commercially needed customers are up to three. Oh well, it used to be up to 300 kWh per year. Now, uh, 300 kW a year. We have now moved that to uh, 1.45 million kWh annual consumption. Now, if you're close, we'll work with you. 
Um, certainly we want to do what we can to help um, all small businesses and, and um, nonprofits and houses of worship achieve their goals. So that's big for us. Um, as I said, that's the average annual consumption. This would include your retail stores, small offices, uh, grocery convenience stores, gas stations, restaurants, so on and so forth, houses of worship, <coughs> small manufacturing. Um, and, and then small business gas customers are also eligible for rebates. In addition to that, I would say to you, for those of you that own small businesses, restaurants, um, we all, in our other sector, we have some, some, some of the commercial equipment that it can be used in kitchens. Although we don't directly uh, get involved in that process, we can provide you with the rebate information to provide uh, the dollars that will get returned to you. The nicest part about our program, and this is what I love best about it, we go in, we do the evaluation, we come back with the proposal. There's, you don't have to fill out all kinds of paperwork. You fill out one form, basically, that says you know, that you agree to the project. And then we take that incentive money right off the top. So it's not fill it out, wait for the check to come back. Let's face it, you know, who has time for that? So, um, so, we're, so what does this really mean for us, for uh, us small business folks, right? Sorry. Um, this is a, a typical project. This was a small restaurant project. I think this was done, this may have been done in Newton, actually. Um, <laughs> and the project cost was $6,091. We provided a $4,265 incentive. The customer's share was $1,826. They had a monthly energy savings of $203. And really what that translated to in this particular case, it was right around the time when um, um, we had an increase in um, minimum, minimum wage. And we had folks, these small business owners that might have one or two part-timers and now they're stuck. Like how do, we, how do we make up that difference? So this $203 made the difference in this guy not having to lay a kid off that's working for him. So it was great. And, and you know, as I said to him, it was, I, I said to him, what does it cost you to pour a cup of coffee? He said, ah, give it take 50 cents. And I said, well, if it's costing you 50 cents, you know, that $203 is 400 cups of coffee that you do not have to pour. And he was pretty excited about that. So, so that's, and you'll see on my next slide, I think the coffee cup and all the, the coffee cups. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> see, those are all the coffee cups. Yeah, I, and he got such a big kick out of that. So, um, so anyway, yeah, we're, we're real excited. We do have, um, Patrick has some power strips down the back. We have um, an opportunity if you want to sign up for an energy audit today um, and give him your information. I think the first 18 of you will get a power strip. Uh, and then, of course, when we come out to the rest of you, we can certainly get power strips. We, but th that's just one, again, a power strip is just another opportunity for savings in your um, business, house of worship, and um, nonprofit. Um, we, we certainly work um, heavily with the nonprofits because we, we, we understand that we may have to do a little more for them um, given the circumstances of you know, raising money and uh, the inability to be able to pay for some of these programs. So, so we're you know, excited. Um, we've been working hard in Brookline. We've been working hard across the Commonwealth. We have, as I said, about 80,000 customers. Um, I can tell you last week, myself and Patrick were out in Marshfield. We were down in Marshfield. Unfortunately, poor Marshfield gets the, um, the brunt. Every time we have a storm, they lose all their power. So, so we're trying to do, you know, be down there making nice. I have a big role in the storm uh, um, restoration process. Um, I lead a team for the restoration on the Cape. So I know, um, you know that's another point of frustration with the utility. So, so these are the kinds of things that we feel that we can do to help maybe make a difference and take some of the sting out. Thank you, Maureen. Thank you for your talk. And this, this little brochure is also available in the back. This outlines basically um, the entire program and basically what I kind of what I just said and the contact information. Um, it's a pretty simple process. If for some reason you, you're not interested in signing up today but would like to in the future or talk to somebody or mention it, um, you can just go on the Mass Save website and put in your zip code and it will bring you to the appropriate vendor to talk to. Um, and then the other thing I just want to mention is I know that there was a lot of talk about the decals. These kids are great. They're absolutely amazing. I, and congratulations to the parents and the educators that work with those kids because it was just enlightening to listen to their. Um, and we have a great education program at Eversource that we fund opportunities to bring teachers um, out of the classrooms and we put in um, temporary teachers for the day, we pay for that, and, and give the teachers an opportunity to be educated so that they can then let that, uh, share that education with their students. So we're real excited about that piece of it as well. So um, 
Yeah, well, we can uh, thank you so much for sharing your information and for being here and having Patrick here as well and for sponsoring. So we really appreciate yeah. Everest for the support of the program. I uh, want to make sure we have time for questions. So folks, anybody? we'll be around for a little bit yes, if you have in the back. But anybody with an immediate <laughs> question that for for Maureen or for Patrick, Diane? Did you mention how much the energy audit costs? Oh, sorry. Thank you. It's a no cost energy. Uh, thank you. I, I usually say that right off. Free. Yeah. So it's absolutely free. It doesn't cost you a dime. You are not committing to anything. All you the only thing you're committing to is a little bit of time for one of us to walk around, basically look and we look at everything. We look at pipe insulation and aerators and um, thermostats and uh, lighting and lighting controls and, and we really encourage you to share your pain points because we'll do what we can to help resolve those issues. Yes? Um, a number, I've been here with uh, the bed and breakfast and we live above the shop so to speak and I think a number of the ho smaller hospitality businesses in town have this issue that we're mixed use or essential mm -hmm. commercial. Right. Are we eligible for this or is there a different you are, and, and we work, it's funny, on my way over here today, I was on the phone with them. We have a multi-family group that we work with as well. And, and you know, this, it's been frustrating for people in the past because they've had to call A to do this and B to do that. And, and, and we're working really hard um, internally to uh, eliminate those obstacles for you. So, so absolutely feel free to, you know, reach out and we'll, we'll, we'll help you along in that process. Yes, sir. If, uh if you've already had an audit done in the last two years, mm -hmm. uh, can you have additional audits? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's you know, <laughs> this is an evolution, as you know, every day. I mean, I, I think about this, when I first started in the industry, this 60 watt bulb was about, I think it came, well, they had the CFLs for a while, which I hate those lights, by the way. Um, and then, um, these are down at eight watts. I, I mean, look at that, that reduction to, from 60 mm -hmm. to eight watts. It's amazing, it's absolutely amazing. So, um, absolutely. Because you, we, we're always finding new technologies, and we're always funding newer technologies. I mean, the mini splits is a perfect example. We didn't do that a while ago. The EV stations, if, if you have a business that has a parking area, I know parking's limited in the, in the city, uh, but um, if you have an, a business that may, may need a, potentially an EV station, um, we're basically paying for all the infrastructure to the stub, and then um, basically, and then you take it from there. So, and you know, Charge Point or one of those companies that you can engage with, um, you can then charge however appropriately. Or if you want to provide some free charging for your for your customers, that's just another opportunity to show bit, uh, folks that you're committed. And just yes. one one other question for the night. I know that the Massachusetts Clean Energy Council has a lot of programs for mini splits and mm -hmm. things like that. Is that separate? Or are you involved in that? Or no. So so we're doing a lot of that stuff ourselves. So as I said, it, you know we're. If we if we don't have it available in our program, we have um, the resources available that we can give you the information. So that way, you're not being you know bouncing all over the place. Yes, ma'am. Um, on behalf of my nonprofit, mm -hmm. um, which is the House of Worship, um, we were told that if we already had CFLs, we couldn't get any help or any donations That's to convert true. to LEDs. That's not true. I don't. I don't know who gave so you that information, I but I can assure this? you that is not true. You will have LEDs if you have CFLs. Because we would very much like to do that. And so if it you sounds can like see Patrick is. If, if you, you can see Patrick yeah. on the way out, he'll take your name and number information, and uh, and and we'll get you uh, get somebody connected to take care of that for you. Another mini gripe. How long does it take to get your light bulbs once you've ordered them? So we don't just. It's not just truck. a. Ca it's not just a case of like ordering the light bulbs and and um. So mm -hmm. in this in this particular program. No, I mean, for me personally, I never got the ones I ordered. For the res in the residential program, yeah. you know, I'll take your name and number and reach out to the residential mm -hmm. program for you. But um, I don't, I, I'm not involved with that piece of it. This program, I can tell you, takes about from from start of the, um, uh, you know, the uh, proposal, excuse me, the evaluation process through the proposal, through the installation, and the removal. I would say if you said six weeks is about a reasonable time, and that's really because we're waiting on materials. You know, we're like um, the last thing I want is somebody to look up in a ceiling and see that we just replaced bulbs we don't do that we take those out we, we put new fixtures in now we want people to feel like we're making a difference so thank you um, and I know um, both um, both of you are going to be back Maureen mm -hmm. in the back answering questions for the whole time and you're welcome to stay after uh, and ask more questions and and just a show of hands who's already had an energy assessment an energy audit from Massive all right so that's, that's great, that's great.
So now you can have another one. But there's, all, <laughs> and, and there's, all, there's always an opportunity. So I, I, I apologize, I kind of digressed a moment, but the decals I was talking mm -hmm. about, we created a decal ourselves, um, which has the, uh, basically it looks like our logo, mm -hmm. and it says, um, I forget the exact wording on it, small business energy partner or something. Yeah. So it indicates that you've participated. So you're certainly welcome to one of those decals if you've participated or are going to participate. Um, and maybe what we could do, we could talk offline, uh, we, maybe we can help fund those decals for the kids and, and that would be a, a even, yeah. yeah. Great. So Great, all right, well thank you. Thank you all. Um, we have an announcement, and then in a minute we're going to switch gears and have Bobby and Colleen and Michael, I don't know where he is in the room, come and join us up at the, our panel. <laughs> so you guys can start to make your way uh, while Diane makes an announcement. If, if anybody saw the note about bringing your Eversource bill to this event, come find me, show me your bill, I'll give you some more information, and I'll put your name in the raffle container. By way of introduction, I just want to say thank you to our three esteemed panelists. I think it's actually going to be really helpful to hear their stories after hearing from Tommy uh, and from Zoe and from Maureen. This will help to actually put it into um, real practice. How, what does this all look like when you're actually a small business owner uh, or a you know nonprofit leader trying to? Um, you know, bring green energy into play, bring energy efficiency into play, and other strategies for reducing your climate footprint. So we have Michael Kirstein, who is from Sign and Shoes. We have Colleen Sudanowski from Rufulo Cafe, and Bobby Zucker, who is representing two organizations, The Village Works, which is co-working space in Brookline Village, and also uh, the Brookline Teen Center. So um, we don't have to go in any particular order, but I do have, I think, Colleen's slides mm -hmm. queued up. So Colleen, if you're happy to yeah. talk. So what we'll do is Colleen will tell a little bit of a story about her business for a couple minutes, uh, and then um, we'll move over to, to Michael and to Bobby, and we'll save the questions until the end. So you guys can hear all of their stories, uh, and then we'll, we'll ask a couple questions. And then afterwards, we're going to break into small groups. So um, you'll have a chance to ask more questions if you're sitting with one of them. OK. Go ahead, Colleen. So yeah, so uh, first of all, thank you all so much. It's an amazing representation of our, our community. This is really Can everybody hear Colleen? Yeah. 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 Um, okay, so I did actually prepare something. Um, as someone in the food industry, I feel a tremendous responsibility to encourage and educate our community about sustainability. Um, food is a commodity and a necessity. I am motivated by the sense of powerlessness that I feel when I think about how much work there is to be done. But when I bring the task closer to home as my starting point, I realize we can really make a big impact. Um, most importantly, we need to um, feel united and work together. At Refrulo, we try to utilize as many environmentally sound practices as possible. Um, because I engaged in the process of becoming a certified green restaurant, thanks to my good friend Anne, um, we not only looked at the obvious visible changes, but also the infrastructure, such as water pressure flow, and upgrading our lighting to energy conserv conservative LED. Um, to my surprise, this was much easier and friendlier than I anticipated. Thank you. <laughs> um, changing our water pressure flow per minute took some time to outfit our sinks, but in all sincerity, this was one of the most valuable changes we made because it controls our water usage for us. And as you can imagine, we as restaurants go through a lot of water just washing dishes. Um, composting and educating our staff was another action item. I would say we, that more than over half our waste goes to compost. And I do encourage and allow our staff members to bring in their compost as well so that we can um, educate um, them and our customers. Um, my goal by 2020 is to have built a solid community of restaurateurs who can, we can all share like mind um, philosophies and create support systems um, where we can harmonize the consumption and exhaustion of food to zero waste. 
Um, we have recently brought our carbon footprint to um, really into light and stopped using, made the decision to stop using avocados because they come from so far away. We really wanted to kind of stand behind, you know, our, our philosophy. Um, and as well, we're going to stop using all plastic takeout cups by November. So we will not be using those at all anymore. Um, I think that we must also really uh, include our, our youth in the lead, and um, I do believe that these efforts will pay off. Um, you know, I, ha I am very fortunate to be near the high school, so I feel like I can hopefully influence them in their, you know, in their thoughts and as they move out into the world. Um, so I, you know, it, I really plan to continue on this path and relearning and, and educating and dialoguing about, you know, sustainability with customers and with our employees and just to kind of keep it keep it moving. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, will, I will say that this, um, the top 10 environmental steps, like there's a copy of it in the back near Daria and Kathleen if anybody wanted to actually look closely at that. So great. Thank you. And then next I think we have Bobby. Those works. Yep. The Bill's works. So we are a, uh, a co-working space in Brookline Village. Uh, many of our um, workers live in Brookline, and uh, well, you can't hear me. All right, well, see me as well. All right, um, and you know, the, the one of the main things we were looking to do was create a, a location um, and an opportunity for people that wanted to work closer to home to be able to work closer to home. So from the start, our our concept is environmentally friendly is helping people reduce their individual um, uh, ecological footprints by by not going downtown by not driving to their office by being able to walk and I think about two-thirds of our members live in Brookline and many of them walk or bike or scoot to, to the uh, to, to the office uh, we we've done several things within the building I think it, maybe the next slide has a couple pictures here um, we actually upgraded all of our um, thermostats to Ecobee, uh, which is a, uh, a smarter thermostat that allows us more control. Uh, we actually spend a lot of money giving individual control to a lot of different spaces so that people can control their own space and when they're, when they're there and when they're not, that, that they don't need to be doing that. Uh, there's water fillers all over the building. Uh, we actually have uh, both, we, in our kitchen, we have still water, we have ambient water, and we have sparkling water. People are constantly, um, you know, I, I don't see bottled water at all. Um, it's, it's rare that people are coming in with it. We're, we create a culture where people are thinking about the environment. Uh, we've gone through a couple stops and starts with our compost. We have a new system that we, a, a company that we're happy with that is, is working well. Um, and we see our job is actually, um, you know, we have over 200 members to you know, to talk to them about that. We have we have uh, lunch and learns, and has actually presented and hosted some events there. Our members are signing up for for 100 percent electricity. They're they're finding out more and doing the the, the townwide composting. Um, and a lot of it is it's it's tricky because we're changing people's habits, and and so you know we then you know Ann helped us actually with the, the landfill recycle and compost sign. People don't exactly know what goes where, and, and once once they start figuring it out, all of a sudden we start getting more compost, less trash, um, more recycling, and these are the kind of things that, that make a difference. And so, and actually you can see a picture in here as well. Um, I mean, there we we are we. I don't know, you know, I, I have a couple of partners. I think they know where the paper goods are. I don't know where they are because everything is out. Um, that you know, people are using. You know, we're we're reusable you know, silverware and and because a lot of other places you're like, oh yeah, here's the here's the here's the paper goods and, and put that out and we, we never do. We really want to make sure that everything's being reused. And I think our members appreciate that um, and uh, like the, the the culture and the space. Um, and it all flows together. I think mean, because of the efforts we make on the environmental side we see benefits um, in the uh, in, in our members retention and, and people coming in. I love that the, there's a little, the little sign you can see on the bottom of this landfill recycle compost is people writing down their questions of what goes in the compost and then the staff researches it and then puts a check to say yes like can the string from my tea bag go in the compost and then it waits until somebody confirms and then it checks so that 
is adding to you know kind of community understanding and reducing mistakes. I'm just going to switch because Bobby, why don't we just stick with you and do the teen center, and then we'll go back to Michael. Sure. So I mean, Brookline Teen Center is on Aspinall Ave. Uh, we just entered our seventh year. Uh, we have a couple board members here. We have a couple members of the design and construction team here. So thank you for being here. Um, Back in 2011 and 12, when we were going through the, the process, it was a teen-driven and teen-led organization. The teens actually worked with Studio in LA um, to, to design the center. Um, and th there was no <coughs> doubt in any of our minds that we wanted to be a LEED certified building. Uh, we, we went through the process. Diane helped us uh, tremendously uh, you know, with water efficiency and, and, and reusing spa the space itself. Um, and maintaining as much of it as we could. I, one of the things that's interesting about it is, you know, it was sort of a, a big leap that we made. Um, a couple years later, the stretch code came in, and a lot of that stuff is required now. Um, and so we, we were ahead, we're pulling, you know, that the, you know, now, now we stuff, you know, but, but it was, you know, but it's about environmental, uh, um, you know, air quality, and all that kind of stuff went into it. Uh, the teens were really a big part of it, and it still is. But again, you know, we're also a, a member organization, and, and it's hard to educate and maintain. We actually struggle with our recycling program because we have bins that say trash and recycling, and we end up getting filled with trash. And, and so we, you know, it's a constant struggle on what, where that balance is, and it's, it's something that we all fight every day is, is what are those choices and how do we educate it and ensure that that stuff's happening because, you know, it's terrible. And so we, we, now we stop, you know, now it's like, all right, you know, People were trying to recycle, and that's all going to the trash, and that feels lousy for, for everybody. And so it's stuff that we're still working on. It's a constant battle. Uh, but uh, you know, one, one of the really neat things was uh, out of the high school, um, the, the, through their entrepreneurship and environmental program, uh, a couple teens wanted to create uh, community composting. Um, and they did a bunch of research, and the only cans which you can see there, they, they had to get them from Europe because I, I still don't know why, but that was what the <laughs> research was. And, and this was this was you know this was three four years ago, and, and uh, they worked best for this type of program, and uh, we actually were able to get uh, save that stuff. Who was providing it at the time? Now Black Earth does the compost program to get uh, community composting. We have people all week long walking all over Brookline Village and dropping off their compost there. Uh, the town really liked the program and actually took it over uh, earlier, I think this calendar year, or maybe the last school year uh, from us, which has been great. I hope they're looking to expand it. I know there's some schools trying to bring compost into to their school so people on their way to school can drop it off. You know, if we can make it uh, convenient, we can make this uh, work much better, really reduce waste. You see it, I mean, like, the amount of trash you have in your house if you have the, the I mean, I have that bucket that goes out every uh, Monday, Monday morning, and we have less trash because we're throwing everything in, in the compost, and, and you know, we'd like to have less compost and maybe eat our, you know, clean our plates, but, you know, one, one battle at a time. And so, uh, you know, I think the teens actually, you know, wanting to drive it, having a place like the Teen Center, it allows them to be creative, uh, try something, um, and now not only have those kids who have now graduated or off of college, this is still a legacy here. They're, it's still here and the town's looking to expand the program and, and sometimes it takes uh, you know, community organizations and businesses to lead uh, for, for the government and uh, others to follow and I think that's what we're looking to do and hopefully you know, maybe Brookline leads and then Newton and then Massachusetts and we just, we just keep going. Uh, you know, it might take a couple of, you know, a, a new election to get the, the whole country. Great, <laughs> right, thank you, Bobby. I'm just curious, quick show of hands, who in the room is either composting through their business or in their residence at this point? Wow. I use that. <laughs> That's very, oh great, you're dropping it off at the teen center. <laughs> Fabulous, okay. Thank great. you for having it. Yeah. Um, Michael, over to you. Let me switch the slides. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm, um, Sorry. I'm here as part of the commercial for-profit center uh, sector, um, but the problems that we have are exactly the same. Um, in our case, one of the things that we do is get constantly inundated with somebody who's got a great idea of how they can save us money mm -hmm. and help us uh, reduce our carbon footprint and do all these wonderful things for us. 
And probably like most of you, I stopped listening after about the first sentence and maybe don't even open the email. In this particular case, uh, it was a peer. It was David Wyshynski, who owns uh, Eureka Puzzles, who had already gone through uh, the LED program. And uh, so it's a peer. So you try it. And the way it worked for us is uh, uh, the Eversource uh, comes in and does, like, like you heard, does a survey. It doesn't take six weeks, by the way, from the time you start this to the time you end it. Uh, it's like dealing with other, uh, any other big utility and everything else. It can, take, it can take four months. It can take six. But it gets done. So they'll come in and do a, a survey, and they'll say, fine, you've got these many light bulbs. All right? We can do this. We can do that. We can do the other. And at the end of the day, we'll save you $1,000 a year. Now, what we're going to charge you is $1,000, which we can break up into so many payments. Your light bulbs will last you, for sake of argument, six years. Well, we were paying uh, eight bucks a bulb in bulk for these halogen bulbs that were uh, blowing out every six months and turned my store into a nice tropical paradise with all the heat they were giving off. <laughs> right. So, you know, you've got the savings. Uh, you know how long halogen bulb, uh, LED light bulbs last. Uh, they say six years, and probably like any other businessman, I just cut that in half. And either way you look at it, you're ahead of the game. All right? So with us, we assumed that the savings were right, and we just turned around and uh, took the savings and turned it into this. We just uh, took it. So we're not particularly saving a whole lot, but we've squeezed that balloon and taken the, uh, uh, the money from one sector and put it to something that's worthwhile. Lowered our costs, probably lowered our heating costs. And yeah, there are some... There are some savings, certainly are some savings there. We've, we've lowered it by quite a bit. The other things that we'd love to have uh, 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 some discussions and some help with are other things that aren't quite that easy for, for profit business. For instance, things you'd think that would be um, simple, uh, recycling. Well, if you have eight employees. Now remember, we're talking here, we're not talking Nordstrom's, we're talking uh, a local business. So where a Nordstrom's could just say, fine, we're going to have a cycling, recycling program, and we're going to uh, outsource it, and that's fine. Where do I put this stuff? If I get five, six, seven, eight employees, this one buys a Coke, you, get, you, you end up with these bottles and cans and stuff, whether you, however nicely you want to approach it, you still end up with this stuff. What do you do with it? Take it home at night? Where does it go? Where do I, where do I physically put it? I'm using every square inch. You know, you can always find some place, but you have to get rid of the stuff. Where does it go? You don't want it to uh, create uh, health problems and bugs. How do I do it? Now, if we could, for sake of argument, if there was a commercial uh, 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 program available, uh, uh, like residential can, can have for recycling, why can't, why can't the commercial sector? I mean, why, why not? There's a couple of other ways to go around that. Um, cardboard. Uh, we generate, we get shipments of shoes and boxes like this. What do you do with that? All right, now, I know we're supposed to recycle it, but the last time I looked for a, uh, a price, I got a, 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 a bid of $1,000 a month. Well, guys, that's, you know, I want to do this stuff. How do we do it? Now, we solved that one just by the way, as we put in a free ad on Craigslist. This is, if you're moving, we have boxes for you. <laughs> and they're all gone. <laughs> so that does solve itself, but you know, it, to be able to get into a town program where we're not expecting it for free, but to be able to get with the, uh, the, uh, the amount of people involved in it, that would be helpful too. So, okay, that's, that's our story. Great. Thank you. Uh, open it up to questions uh, for any of the panelists. Uh, and then after we do our questions, we're going to break into our small groups. So a question in the back? Yeah. Yeah, I just have a question for Colleen, actually. Um, just on a sort of global scale, I know you mentioned the avocados that you did away with because of the energy wasted. But one thing that I actually noticed even right on coming in was like the rooibos tea, which is a South African tea. Um, and just the, the sustainability of places like the Drakensberg, where it comes from in South Africa, 
where that's been ripped apart by places like Twinings and things like that, that's actually hurting carbon emission on a global scale because of what it's doing to the environment there. Is that something that is being thought about on a regular basis? And Personally, me? Or just in, in general, uh, with your peers in the restaurant industry, do you know what you're talking um, about? I would say we're very conscious about, about you know, where we source our, you know, mm. Our purveyors and where we source our food and our ingredients, and um, you know, always wanting to do the right thing. Yeah. And so, um, you know, that that's where I come from making my decisions. Is, is you know, morally, am I making the right decision and what I'm providing for my you know for my community? So yes, the answer is yes, and thank you for bringing my attention to that. But. Um, yeah, of course I want to do the right thing. I, you know, I want I want to benefit everything around me. So, in my environment, that's really important to me. I think one of the, just to add a comment to that, I think um, one of the overarching sort of messages, I think, of this effort is step by step, mm -hmm. right? That, you know, you can, the perfect can be the enemy of the good. Um, and it's important to recognize, okay, what's the biggest impact? What's my next? What's my next? Um, and, that, and try not to get lost in, you know, feeling frustrated by not being able to get it all done at once. But, um, so, yeah, go ahead. I'm wondering what the green restaurant certification costs, the process, the fees, the, did you have to hire a consultant? I do a lot of lead certification mm -hmm. for buildings. Yeah. And it's very expensive. Yeah, it was, um, it, it was an initial cost, you know, in the beginning, but I feel like, um, you know, not even, I mean, the recognition is important, but also the process that it made me go through to, for me to realize, you know, things like, you know, my task list and what's important to think about and can be an ener energy efficient and, and um, sustainable and all of those different, you know, aspects that, that come with it. Um, so it, I think the cost really, you know, was worth me spending because um, because I think it, because it's moving me in, an, in the direction of, of the greater good, you know. And, it, and I don't think I necessarily would have done that had I not had, I not had uh, an organization that helped me kind of see these things through. The organization being? The Green Restaurant Association. So for the Just fee that you pay them, they provide you with a consultant <coughs> at the Green Restaurant Association who walks you through the process. Yes. Is the fee hundreds, thousands, tens it's of thousands? It's hundreds, hundreds. hundreds of thousands. Under a thousand. Yeah, just under a thousand. Yeah, it depends on the size of your budget yes. as an organization. So if you're a, you know, a large university food service operation, it's going to be different than if you're a cafe. This question is for Michael. I know you're involved with the business designated designation district. Are you doing a study? Can you just talk about how that can have implications on sustainability and climate action? Yeah. Well, this is this is talk about things that are that are preliminary. Uh, we're. Um, uh, so a couple of us got together to put together a business investment district uh, for the Coolidge Corner area, which uh, uh, trying to make the area more, uh, among one of the other things we're doing, is trying to make it more com um, uh, in competition uh, with other areas uh, 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 around. Um, you can tell from the way I'm stuttering here how unprepared I am for talking this, but that's but what, what it, um, <coughs> what we're doing is trying to make Coolidge Corner be Coolidge Corner, not it to be Fandle Hall or the Native Mall. Uh, and that, uh, if anybody has any trouble banking, you should come to Coolidge Corner because there's plenty of banks for you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that kind of thing. Let's get a, let's get a mix of stores. Let's do it. And among the other things we can do there, uh, we want to turn it into a cafe culture. You know, cafe culture. Uh, let's have some outside seating. Let's have green walls. And then the idea led to. Uh, uh, there's only been one meeting on this one. The idea led to, well, there's no overall green plan for uh, Coolidge Corner. It's never come up. So, you know, how nice would it be to get uh, uh, more trees, uh, more green more green walls? Anybody seen those, some of those green wall gardens? Some of the gardens are fantastic. It's not just planting vines up the side, which I think personally think are great, uh, but they have whole gardens that are just vertical. Um, if you look down also, if you look down on a Google map at the top of Coolidge Corner, um, you see a lot of nice flat open space that generates a lot of heat. Um, uh, I think you, you had inside containers for hydroponic. 
how nice would it be to have some farming on the top? Anyhow, there's lots of ideas that are just bubbling along, kind of what we're doing today. There's bubble forward. We can have a really nice green space up there. Great. Thank you, guys. Thank you. questions, but I'm mindful of the time, and I really want to make sure we have time to sit in our small groups. So um, what we're going to do, we're going to have an organizational challenge for everybody. Um, we want to sit in groups of about six to eight. Um, so if you look around yourself in your t your row, so view this little group right here, you could be a group. Just turn your chairs and face each other. Um, right over here, so two rows can be a group. So pull your chairs around. Um, and our facilitators will come and join you and help with instructions. So, in the words of a little girl from Sweden, she said something to the effect, uh, I'm scared, I want you to be scared, but I want you to be scared so that you're gonna act. We need all of you to act individually to help out with this crisis, because it is a crisis. And you, you know, you can use the word scared, concerned, but we need all of your help as business people, as nonprofit people, as houses of faith, and these great organizations and the stakeholders and the people that help finance this. It's time to act. If not now, when? So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. focus a lot on climate with individuals and with big corporations and this splits the difference and says local businesses also have a role and want to get out there and want to be part of the solution but have very particular requirements and needs and part of this event is helping small businesses understand where they can both make their business better and reduce their impact on the environment at the same time. Well, I mean, obviously, it's our planet, right? We, we all want to work towards saving our planet. And, and you know, we're very fortunate at um, Eversource. We have great support and great resources available for our small business community to be able to participate. And, and not only just small business, but the larger businesses, the residents. I happen to work in the small business uh, component. But there's uh, lots of opportunities across the state for people to get involved. And every little change in aggregate makes a big change. Well, I think it's really important, the idea that, uh, that business uh, can be part of the solution to the climate crisis. It's urgent, uh, and, and our, 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 the way that we actually work to address these problems requires everybody to be involved, including the business community. And it's great to see so many uh, members of the business community come out here and say, this matters to me, I want to get involved in this. And many of, many of them have already been doing some really great work. I'm learning about all the improvements that businesses have made over the years here in Brookline. Uh, and it's, it's just fascinating to see how much they've been doing and how much more the business community can do. We're learning about that today. I think because ultimately, you know, this really go goes back to benefit ourselves and our, and our living spaces and our, you know, restaurants and businesses. Um, I think the more effort and, and um, thought we put into this topic, the more our lives are going to be, be, you know, become more 
vibrant and green and, and enjoyable. Clearly, there's a, there's a moral imperative to address what is a really serious crisis uh, for all of us uh, in the, on the planet, uh, and particularly here locally, there are things that we can do. And so, so morally, it's just the right thing to do. But from a business perspective, you know, we had these kids come uh, today and speak to us about, about the future and the need uh, for us as adults to take this very seriously. And, and what they said loud and clear was also this, we are going to support businesses that are taking this, this crisis seriously, and we're not gonna support those that aren't. Uh, and so from, there's the moral perspective, but also just from a business perspective, uh, the businesses that will exist in 10 to 20 years are the ones that have taken steps right now, today, to actually address this issue. The clearest reason is we all have to. We all have to. We have to in our personal lives, we have to in our professional lives, and small businesses are part of that. But in a community like Brookline, where we are at the forefront and we really do value uh, being progressive and moving forward on issues, a business that recognizes this challenge and is publicly part of the solution is the kind of business I want to shop at. Well, again, it, you know, it goes back to saving, you know, I have, I'm expecting my sixth grandchild and I want my sixth grandchild and my fifth grandchild and my fourth grandchild and, and those that come after them to have a better place to live. So I think we all have a responsibility. Um, you know, we heard some young ones here today. They were great. The kids at the school do amazing work and, and uh, hopefully we can, um, again, work together t for the greater good. Oh, I think that has to happen from like a personal, like we, you know, it comes from, from our desires and how we you know live our daily life and and who we can influence and how we can influence them I think it really is our own actions so we have uh, local state and national resources locally uh, town hall is serves as a great resource the Brookline Chamber of Commerce, the Merchants Associations are all working together alongside Climate Action Brookline uh, and other organizations in town and so really it is a community effort and my hope is that folks continue to work together at events like this uh, we have big events usually in the spring around climate and if we keep talking to each other and keep sharing our positive experiences and our new ideas and importantly our successes we're going to see each business each home get better and better about this every year so right now we're doing um, small uh, business energy efficiency audits. They're free of charge, a low cost, uh, excuse me, a no cost assessment. What we do is we provide uh, an opportunity for businesses to become more energy efficient by providing the uh, materials necessary, the uh, recycling necessary, and the uh, labor necessary to uh, achieve those goals. Real simple uh, for us, if you just go on masssave.com, put in your zip code, whether you're a business or a resident, and, um, and they'll take you to the vendor partner that we have vetted for the area, and then they'll set up the uh, no-cost assessment, and, and away we go. Yeah, I mean, the benefits is having a livable planet. I mean, that's the benefit is, is actually being able to, to sustain the kind of society that we build today. But it but it it will only happen if we're willing to make some serious and significant changes. Uh, and that's the thing. And, and what we have to understand from a business standpoint is that in the short term, that's going to take a, that's going to, to, to cost. Um, that's going to cost us as individuals, as residents. It's going to cost business to do that in some ways. Uh, it's not all going to be, you know, every single thing we do is going to save us money and it's going to be great. We're going to have to take some, some serious uh, steps that are going to cost us a bit in the short run so that we can have a place where we can all live in the long run. I mean, I, I like many people, watched um, Greta Thunberg's speech um, to the UN where, uh, where she is, is, is saying, like, you all know what the problem is. You all know how, um, how much of a crisis this is. The only question is, what are you going to do about it? And not what are you going to do about it 10 years from now. What are you going to do about it today? Uh, and I think that's the question a lot of folks are asking inside the room right now is what are we going to do about this today? How are we all going to pitch in um, to make meaningful change here? I mean, I think that there's the, the, the town of Brookline is, is doing as much as they've been trying to do more as they can. And I know they have a great website that has resources on it. So I guess maybe that might be a, a place to start. We're 26258 and we passed. We're in Article 21. And we're here today to ask companies if they can kind of like get like a de businesses, <laughs> if they can get a decal for um to put in front of stores to tell that they don't like throw away unused merchandise and uh, what do you think the business can do to help reduce carbon footprints if you want to pass my around this? Yeah. okay 
um, well, throwing away um, f- food and um, merchandise is a big part of um, carbon footprints because it takes a lot of resources that could hurt the environment um, to make those things. So it's a big waste to just throw them away. So this could really help them. And if we donate them to other people, then it wouldn't go directly into the trash with no use. It would be used by someone who could use it more than just a landfill. Okay. Um, well, they can like stop throwing away like trash and like recycle it. And, like same with all their like old merchandise stuff. Um, well, stores have so many like so much merchandise, and they can give it to charities. I mean, think about how many people could use that unsold merchandise versus like the trash can doesn't want it, so.